All right, we're at 10 o'clock, Rabbi. We are at 10 o'clock. Marvelous. So um, just a quick repetition of what we're doing. If you were running on Jewish Standard Time yesterday or weren't here yesterday, um, this is a dedicated study of the Psalms of Suke de Zimra, the verses, Sukim, of praise and song, Zimra. And um, this rubric is a beginning part of the Shachri morning service on weekdays and on Shabbat We're and on holidays. It's cozy there, getting the RNC. But um, the compilation of the different Psalms depends on what type of a gathering it is. So yesterday we studied Psalm 100, which is specific for weekday morning gatherings. And starting today, we're going to move through the daily Hallel, Psalms 145 through 150, although Rabbi Kleinbaum is reserving the right to teach Psalm 150 as the very last in the book of Psalms herself. And this is when we studied together last time, when I, I came to uh, do some guest teaching in the spring around Pesach, we studied the Egyptian Hallel, um, kind of the Hallel with a capital T in the the. And those are Psalms 113 through 118. This daily Hallel is considered one of the things that can uh, get you a place in the world to come. And actually, Psalm 145 that we're going to study today, um, in the Talmud, it is identified that if you recite the prayer Ashrei, which is mostly made up of Psalm 145, three times a day, a place is reserved for you in the world to come. And this is why we see the prayer Ashrei twice in our morning service and once in our Mincha service. And we get different lines of Psalm 145 sprinkled throughout just daily prayer. It's part of the Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals. And so a lot of these lines are going to sound very familiar. And we encode it into Jewish daily practice to make sure everybody's got a place in the world to come. If only you show up and hear the recitation of this very beautiful psalm. So just a couple words about the prayer Ashrei. Like much of our prayer book, Ashrei is a mashup. It's actually pretty unique in the fact that it is mostly all of one psalm, all of Psalm 145, not skipping any sections but it has just a couple insertions of lines of other Psalms at the very beginning and at the very end. So if I could ask our trusty TA to bring up the page of the Sidor, this is the, the corn Sidor that Harold sent to everybody. All right, hold on just one second. Uh, let me go to full screen. So this, this is the prior page, which has Psalm 100, which we studied yesterday on top mm -hmm. of it. Then there is an intermediate, as you said, mashup. If you look, the Corin door is really great because it lists where everything comes from. There must be 10 Psalms that contribute to this next, uh, next. And then here we go. Here we are, Rabbi. Do you see okay, this? So are, are you seeing I'm Ashrei? Seeing, no, I'm still seeing the page with the Kava. Okay, let me, let me do this a different way. Hold on. Um, all right. And you can find this in absolutely any Sidur of any brand. There okay. it is. Lovely. And Harold, if you would zoom in, um, well, here, let's get to full screen mode. And so you can see the full layout. You can see um, the sort of indentation that indicates where Psalm 145 begins. But Harold, if you would zoom us in maybe to like 100% so that I can show people the marginalia, the, the little sidelines that tell us where okay. each Psalm comes from. How's that? Mm, I did not see a change. The version that we're seeing still is at 77%. Huh. But that's okay. Um, Harold, if you would be so kind as to float over the citation that says Psalm 84 in English or in Hebrew. 
know if this is mysterious, but it seems hey, that when you share your screen, hold on, hold on. I will make I will make this happen. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Psalm eighty four is, is the very better, first. Rabbi? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Hooray. So Psalm 84 is the very first line of this prayer. And that is the Psalm from which we get the name of the prayer, Ashrei. And that's the root in Hebrew, Aleph Shin Resh, like Osher, which means happiness. And so Ashrei means, um, you know, happy are the dwellers in your house. And then we have another citation from Psalm 144 that also begins with the word Ashrei. So Harold, if you would drag us over to the left side of the page and we can look at the Hebrew. Yes, perfect, ideal. You can see on the very far left-hand side of the page in sort of the spidey reprint, the Hebrew abbreviations for um, each of the numbered Psalms. So Pe Dalid is 84 and Kuf Mem Dalid is Psalm 144. And this is to really infuse Psalm 145, which begins with the words Tehila le David, with that sense of overwhelming happiness. It's, it's a pretty optimistic Psalm, as we're all gonna see in a moment, but really to get that feeling of, of overwhelming gratitude and praise that we like to see in Psuke de Zimra, the prayer book authors felt that just a little more insertion of, of the kind of language that explains exactly how we feel to be in God's presence was necessary. So when we move to the, the Psalm itself, you'll see that it starts with the words to Hilad le David and not with Ashrei Yoshvei Vetecha O Yehalalucha Sela. And then Harold, if you'd bring us down to the very bottom so we can see that last line. Yep, yep. Okay, see that little uh, arrow? That under with Tehila Adonai Yadaber P, that little arrow indicates where Psalm 145 ends. That is the last line of Psalm 145. And then the slightly right justified, Va'anachnu Nevarach Ya, that is another piece of the mashup. Uh, Harold, would you bring us over to the English translation? The feeling was that we wanted a line that ended with hallelujah, because so many of the Psalms of this rubric 145 through 150 use the word hallelujah, but Psalm 145 does not include it. And so we added this one little fragment from Psalm 115 to give a nice seal to the end of this prayer. And so everything in between is Psalm 145, but we get that beginning and that end. And I really believe that this helps us with the ethos of Suke de Zimra. We talked about the goal of these verses of praise being to reorient us. As we enter into this space of prayers, we're doing our warm up act. We're literally warming up our voices. Um, we're, we're not required to be in a minion. So whoever's there is there, and that's fantastic. We are praising God before we move to petitioning God for the things that we want. And I think that you will see that this is a beautifully constructed hymn of praise in Psalm 145. And then finally, we are taking ourselves out of the center of the equation. The world does not revolve around us when we're reciting Psuche de Zimra. Everything revolves around God and God's greatness and our appreciation for this greatness. So, um, Harold, thank you so much. You can bring the screen down. Linda, if you have a question, I'd love to hear it. And then we're going to dive into Psalm 145 itself. Yes, I did have a question. The, um, at some point right above the arrow. Oh, uh, no, Linda, I think you muted yourself on purpose because you had a cough. But now we don't hear you. There okay. we go. Above Sorry. the arrow. Um, if above the arrow there were there were circles used i don't know if they were supposed to be quote signs or uh, we are going to talk about why that particular line is indicated so importantly okay. but i wanted to wait until we looked at the text of the psalm oh, itself. okay I, just, okay i noticed it so i asked yeah okay. <laughs> great observation well done all right 
So I am looking for a Hebrew reader of Psalm 145. If Sarah Sloan or Benjamin Shafran happen to be in the room, I, I put you off yesterday. So today's your day. And Saul, I'm adding you to my, my waiting list. Um, but Ben, would you be so kind as to read the Hebrew for us of Psalm 145? And then we'll go back and we'll do the English. גדול אדוני ומהולל מאוד, ולגדולתו אין חקר. דור לדור ישבח מעשיך, וגבורותיך יגידו. הדר כבוד הודיך, ודברי נפלאותיך עשיך. ועזוז נורותיך יאמרו, וגדולתך אספרנה. זכר רב טובך יביעו, וצדקתך יורננו. חנון ורחום אדוני, ערך אפיים וגדל חסד, טוב אדוני לכל רחמיו על כל מעשיו. יודוך אדוני כל מעשיך וחסידיך יברכוך. כבוד מלכותך יאמרו וגבורתך ידברו. להודיע לבני האדם גבורותיו וכבוד הדר מלכותו. מלכותך מלכות כל עולמים וממשלתך בכל דור ודור. סומך אדוני לכל הנופלים וזוקף לכל הכפופים. עיני כל ללכך ישברו, ואתה נותן להם את אוכלם בעיתו. פותח את ידיך ומשביע לכל חי רצון. צדיק אדוני בכל דרכיו וחסיד בכל מעשיו. קרוב אדוני לכל כוריו ולכל אשר יקראו באמת. רצון יראב יעשה, ואת שוועתם ישמע ויושיעם. שומר אדוני את כל אוהביו ואת כל הרשעים ישמיד. תהילת אדוני ידבר פי, ויברכך כל בשר שם קודשו לעולם ועד. is Psalm 145. If you're looking at your Koran Sidor page that Harold sent out, or if you're looking in another Sidor, this is the body of the Psalm. And typically these two words, Tehila le David, are separated out from the rest of the first pasuk, the first line. Um, one interesting thing I wanna say about the beginning of this Psalm. So it's attributed to David, not every psalm is, but this one is part of that collection. This is the only psalm that uses the word tehillah, which literally means a psalm. The book of Psalms is called tehillim, right? So that's the plural of this singular noun tehillah. And it's the only time we see it. We begin with it and we end with it. What do you notice? about the structure of this psalm. What stands out to you? I see Harold's hand, I see Saul, but um, I'm, I'm gonna call on, so sorry, I lost, I lost people's names. I'm gonna bring the screen share down just for a second. Lori, tell us what stands out to you. And I can bring the, the Safari page back up if you like. <laughs> the repetition of uh, your name forever and ever. It's, yes. It's a theme that repeats. Absolutely. And there is something very specific about the Hebrew before we jump into the, the translation of the Hebrew. What is outstanding about the Hebrew, Saul? It's an alphabetical acrostic. Yes, Saul got it. So did Sherry in the chat. And so let's look one more time at the Hebrew before we look to its translation, where we're going to, to lose that sense of the alphabet. So I just wanted to, to point it out while we're still in Hebrew mode. Aleph, and that's why Tehillah le David is often indented away from the rest of the text. We've got Aleph, we've got Bet, we've got Gimel, we've got Dalid. And for those who are in the know about this psalm, it is an imperfect acrostic. 
Does anybody already come packing the definition of what's missing? Harold, tell us. And then uh, is, I'll call there on There is to... no none in the Masoretic text, although there seems to be an indication of a verse with none in the Septuagint and some other translations. Exactly. Uh, Lisa, what do you want to add to that? Lisa Brown. Uh, I was going to say the same thing. Great. So we, we've got this perfect acrostic straight through the whole thing. It picks up after the nun. Lamed, mem, no nun, samech, ayin, pe. And there are um, a couple of, of midrashim about why the nun is not present. Um, Harold is right that we do have some versions of this psalm that include a nun. One of them is the version that we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if anybody's been to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and been to the, the pavilion where they're all laid out, this is one of the, the scrolls that's on display. Um, but this is a very, very early omission. And so if we think about it, maybe it was a copyist error, you know, it just didn't get passed down in the right way. We've been passing it down exactly this way for a really, really long time, because in the Talmud, there are a couple suppositions about why the nun isn't there. Um, anybody have any ideas why that would be? A nun is a weak letter, gets dropped a lot. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody is a student of Mia Rothstein. That is absolutely true that a nun often in Hebrew roots just disappears into nothing. That's pretty common. Excellent. And um, any other any other thoughts on this? So do we know, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, do we know when this was written? Is it, could it have been an, you know, I don't know if the alphabet changed, you know, so uh, I, I the, don't know. Judy, that's a great and imaginative guess. And that's the kind of thinking we want to encourage when we're, we're looking for possibilities. It comes up with the best midrashim, but no, no, the nun was definitely in the alphabet. And you can tell because in Somech Adonai Lecho Hanoflim, it just didn't show up right here. But I encourage that spirit. Uh, ben and then Jacob. Actually, I have a question. Oh, please. Something to do with the fact that it denotes 50? Ooh. So uh, Ben's pointing out the gematria of the letter nun, and that is 50. And that is not a midrash that I am familiar with, but I wouldn't rule it out. And Cantor Nimi, what would you like to add? I, I recall that it has some connection with the Hebrew word nafal, like falling yes. or fallen, but I don't, I always remember never being satisfied by <laughs> any of the midrashic explanations of its absence. I can empathize, Cantor Nimi. So the one that is quoted in the Talmud is that um, King David foresaw the fall of his dynasty, the fall of his kingdom, and um, didn't want a, an acrostic hymn to God to include any reference to uh, the possibility of destruction. And yet, interestingly, in the following line, you still have the word nafal, which makes me wonder if the person who came up with that, that midrash in the Talmud was just kind of on that bent already since nafal, to fall, was in the very next line. Okay, Shep, and then we're gonna go back to the English. I just have one comment. Obviously, every Hebrew letter starts a bad word. Mem, milch, oh, you go on forever. So to eliminate the nun because of I that know, word, I know, I uh, know. It's not really real. <laughs> no, you're right. We can we can come up with a whole list of words that we would want to avoid that start with every Hebrew letter. I just wonder if for King David, maybe he felt extra sensitive about uh, the possibility of this this kingdom he had worked so hard to build crumbling. He was very to sensitive. Death. He was very sensitive. He was a very sensitive guy, King David, sometimes. All right. So um, now as we're going through the English, and we can be thinking a little bit more about the meaning of the words and not just their, their careful ordering, um, think about what, uh, you know, I saw a great question in the chat. So what's the point of an acrostic? What, what is accomplished there? A couple of the Psalms, not 10. I think it's six or seven are in acrostic format. 
And this is probably the most famous of them. Think about what that does for you as the reader or the listener poetically. May I have a volunteer for English reading, please? Aura, go right ahead. A song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and much acclaimed. His greatness cannot be fathomed. One generation shall laud your works to another and declare your mighty acts. The glorious majesty of your splendor and your wondrous acts will I recite. Men shall talk of the might of your awesome deeds and I will recount your greatness. Pause just for one second, Aura. See what we have here, just like we did in Psalm 100, just like you've seen in a couple others before, like Psalm 24. Cree, this is what's written, sorry, this is what we say out loud is in the brackets um, with all of the vowels to help you out. And Kativ, what is actually written, uh, these consonants don't quite match up, but this is what we think the word should be so that Aura could translate it as? Re uh, greatness. Exactly, beautiful. All right, keep going. They shall celebrate your abundant goodness and sing joyously of your beneficence. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in kindness. Okay, pause just one second. Um, reference to the, the 13 attributes of God when we're really trying to get on God's good side. You're gracious, you're compassionate, you're slow to anger, quick to forgive, abounding in kindness in this case. Keep going. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is upon all his works. All your works shall pr praise you, O Lord, and your faithful ones shall bless you. They shall talk of the majesty of your kingship and speak of your might. To make his mighty acts known among men and the majestic glory of his kingship. Your kingship is an eternal kingship. Your dominion is for all generations. The Lord supports all who stumble and makes all who are bent stand straight. Um, or a pause for just a second. Now that we're really hearing the, the translation, I can see why the author might have been hesitant to go for the, the immediate nun as fall when you just spent so much time constructing this line about from generation to generation, an eternal uh, dominion. And to talk about it, about something falling immediately thereafter, that, that would be a, a real antithesis. So instead, um, you know, all who have fallen, Adonai supports them. Keep going, Nora. The eyes of all look to you expectantly and you give them their food when it is due. You give it open-handedly, feeding every creature to its heart content. The Lord is beneficent in all his ways and faithful in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call him, to all who call him with sincerity. He fulfills the wishes of those who fear him. He hears their cry and delivers them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall utter the praise of the Lord and all creatures shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Beautifully read, and thank you for, uh, for rolling with my interruptions. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out was Linda's question. In the Koran Sidur, when you get to verse 16, the one that begins with a pay, you get a little circle right here, draws your eye immediately to that line. What stands out to you about this line? There's sort of a, a practical reason that I am happy to elucidate, but I think there's also sort of an emotional reason. What's special about line 16? I see Harold and um, I wanna prioritize anybody else who didn't get to speak yet. And I think that Ben had a, a hand raised from previous and is patiently waiting. I see that for some people 14 is their favorite line. Yudit. Go for it. Judith? 
me? Uh, did I raise my hand? I'm not aware. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay. No problem. So the next person I saw was Randy. Randy, what, what stands out to you? I think he's talking directly to God in that mm. sentence. Mm. Yes, absolutely. We move from the third person, Adonai, is beneficent in all of God's ways. But there's an intimacy about this line directly, second person address, you. You give it open-handedly. Lovely. Anybody else want to add something? Harold, what do you think? Well, um, since it says you open your hand, potech et yadecha, that is something that we actually do in services where you yeah. open your hand, like you um, bend your knee and uh, kneel when the, when the uh, liturgy says we bend, we, bend our knee, heel, we bend our knees and heel. And it's also often just talked about as the key verse in this psalm, that this is what this psalm is all about. This is, mm -hmm. this is God's relationship, not only to man, but to all of God's creation, every creature hey, on earth. Okay. Every single creature. Gorgeous. And yes, you know, if you could really boil the psalm down to only one line, this would be the line. And as Harold mentioned, this is um, pretty common throughout the world, but it, it's a very old gesture. And we think that our Mizrahi Jewish communities were the first when reciting the psalm. I have it in like, um, shock in weekday trip in my head. That you literally put out your hand when you say poteach et yadecha. Additionally, if you are a person who wears tefillin, the phylacteries, the leather straps that go around your hand and between the four frontlets of your eyes, when you reach this line, the head part of the tefillin needs to be in place so that you can say, poteach et yadecha, and you're wearing your tefillin on your hand, umashbia lecholchai ratzon and you touch the one on your head. Um, Ratzon is also translated as sort of will and intellect. So it's a nice way to embody, as Harold was saying, these different rituals that you bring to morning worship on a weekday, not on a Shabbat when you don't wear tefillin because it's work. Okay, Ben, what, what were you thinking about? I am still having problems with the missing noon. <laughs> I don't understand why the Talmud or our lesson here has to do with falling. It could easily be nifla Hashem b'chol ma'asav. God is one bit. Yep. Why drop it? And um, did, you, did you see in the chat where um, Cantor Nimi said that in the Dead Sea Scrolls version, um, the, the chosen beginning word for the nun line is ne'eman, which is faithful. Just like Shep said, you can come up with any word that you want to avoid with every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You can come up with tons of great, beautiful, laudatory statements about God that begin with the letter nun. And yet they're not there. Um, th this is a mystery which either excites a person to learn more about textual transmission, to sort of uh, play the detective and uncover what the reason could be, or it's incredibly annoying and it's gonna bug you every time you hear this psalm. There's probably also, a couple options in between. I also want to say that uh, verse 16 is part of the blessing on the food. Yes, exactly. It shows up in Birkat Hamazon, well-remembered. All right, Sherry and Simon. So I, I found uh, line two a little curious in that um, I will bless you. Normally you think a person, God blessing us, a mm -hmm. person blessing someone else, which is sort of on God's behalf, but of us blessing God seems a curious concept. Can you talk a little about that? 
Absolutely. Um, it's one of my favorite things to think about the reciprocal nature of blessing, because you're right, Simon, blessing often seems very hierarchical, that it is top down, that God is the one who, who doles out blessing to all of us mortals. But there are these beautiful Hasidic meditations that say, and, and we even see this in Torah language as well, would God exist if it were not for us blessing God's name? God's very existence is in jeopardy if belief and blessing and power are not attributed to God by mortals. And so in this way, we are immensely, immensely powerful. God's power does not exist without our power. Perhaps our power does not exist without God's power. And therefore, we can place ourselves in, in sort of an infinity symbol of passing blessing back and forth. Um, it is not reserved for one or the other of us. Rather, it is enriched by each of us doing our part. It's a... I was talking about this with our um, with our 12 year olds, our B'nai Mitzvah family class, that Shabbat is going to happen whether or not we mark it right. The sun is going to set after seven days and celestial action completely outside of our control. But because we light candles and because we say it is Shabbat. That's how we get this miraculous concept of a rest at the end of every week. And would we have done that had we not been given the idea that this is a, a day that is marked sacred for rest? But there, there is a lot of creative power that we as human beings exert in naming and blessing. And in this, we are B'Tselem Elohim. We are like God. Hey, thank you. Sure. Oh, uh, thanks, Sharon Golub. Listen, the Wikipedia articles about um, each of the Psalms, especially like the majors and Psalm 145 is a major. Uh, so its article is way longer. I, I, I have to say I've been very impressed with Wikipedia recently. So check out Sharon's link to uh, Psalm 145 in the chat. Go ahead, Lisa. So two things I, I was going to say on a more Pleblian level, there's no law if there's nobody to obey that law. Just an yep. You and Sue Rosansky are, are in agreement that uh, you can't you can't have law, you can't have rules, you can't have a ruler if there's nobody to rule. And so this could be this can be uncomfortable, you know. It is it is subjugation, um, but perhaps at least it is reciprocal or it is mutual. God is also subject to our naming and our blessing and our rules. And the second thing is that I, I don't think I've, and when I, won't, I can't come up with an example, but I don't think I've ever seen an acrostic where there's not a letter missing. Where there's I, not a letter missing? I think all of them that, I've, that I can recall are imperfect in that, in that mm. way. Yeah. I'm going to have to, um, I or will. Any of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I will get us the full list and we got to do a study. But yes, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Lisa. The ones that stand out to me, they're always imperfect. Maybe that's a statement. Okay, Cantor Nimi and then Judy Hollander. I, I just find it so striking that, um, it, you know, notwithstanding that, that m many acrostics are imperfect, that it is in fact an imperfect mm -hmm. acrostic that is like the seminal, um, for lack of a better term, like warm up psalm. Like that this is the one, if you don't do any other part of Suke de Zimra in a service, like in Mincha, for example, oh. or in Slichot, that like this is the stand-in and that it is in fact this this you know this imperfect acrostic that that serves as that um kind of quintessential uh lead-in beautiful okay judy and then saul um i've been reading that there it's common i don't know what i mean by common that the i n and the peg can be flipped in the order and also that Echa that we you yes. referred to early is um, pretty much an acrostic. And my understanding of acrostic and came up in our conversation on the chat is it represents completion. It's the whole alphabet. And so that's one of the impetuses, I guess, or impulses behind it. Yeah. 
sort of a very human trait, right? We want we want the merism. We want A to Z. And Harold, thank you so much for for doing some of the research for us in the chat. Um, Psalm 119 is the most complete of all the acrostic psalms. And um, Marsha, I totally agree with you that this is a beautiful artistic statement about the um, the most true fact about humanity, that we are imperfect and yet we strive for perfection. Saul, and then Barbara. So um, about us blessing God, I, I learned uh, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe used to say that a Jew should always ask another Jew how they are. Because in his time, the Jew would always respond, Baruch Hashem, my back hurts, but you know, da 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 da. But they would always respond, Baruch Hashem. And the Rebbe said, you should always give a Jew a chance to bless God's name. Mm. Lovely. And yes, that, that's very much, you know, this is the point of Psalm 145. This is the point of Psuche de Zimra. Infinite opportunities to bless God's name. Opportunity to bless God's name with practically every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Barbara. Yeah, um, when we came to um, open-handedly, um, I was so happy to see that. I don't know, I just smiled. And maybe mm -hmm. it was that most of these um, Psalms have right hand of God. And yes. this is open-handed, so it's anyone's included. I don't know, that I had a very strong reaction to it. And I also, uh, I saw Sarah Siegel in the chat. Finally, not the right hand of God from a resident lefty. Um, yes, and I, it, Barbara. I was just going to say, I didn't even see that. But yeah, we know we have that in common, left-handedness. So. Uh -huh. yeah. I see you were, uh, you were predisposed to love this line. But that being said, I, I totally agree with you that the, the sentiment of being like giving open-handedly what nicer thing could you say about somebody? You know, that, that sense of generosity um, and welcome. Um, and there, there have been some points in the chat about acrostics that match up with the, the letters of the author's name, Lakado D being a major one. Um, and that, you know, the, the authors seem particularly personally invested in making sure they don't skip any of the letters of their name. Um, but we don't necessarily see that in the Psalms unless God's name is made up of every letter and we're, we're trying to spell out God's name, which would be a lovely interpretation that still doesn't satisfy uh, Ben's curiosity for why the nun fell, down, fell out. And Psalm 119 is a beautiful, beautiful example. And it looks like uh, one of the translations that, that Levy actually includes an N line or a nun line. Where, where did I see this in the chat? If the person who put that in wants to reveal and remind me of themselves. Oh, Randy said, uh, Randy Axelrod, you, right? Yes, I did. Um, do you want me to read it he said um, yeah no nun did david pen our praises to often form themselves in silence which i oh. think is very nice that is gorgeous and i i love that as an innovation of the poet himself to like give credence to the fact no nun did david pen i am creating an interpretation, a new work of art that is inspired by this psalm. And my contribution, my addition, is uh, to, to fill the void that was left. So lovely. And also his note about silence and, and filling the silence. Yes. So, um, of course, you know, stop me at anytime if you've got more thoughts or questions about Psalm 145, but this is the way that we begin the daily 
recitation of Hallel. Um, starting with this one, remember there was some controversy in the Talmud about, um, at first, you know, Rabbi Yossi says, may my lot be with those who say a Hallel every day. And then the, the Talmudic voice says, oh, no, no, no. The people who say Hallel every day, they're cursors, they're blasphemers, and then calms itself down by saying, oh, actually, Rabbi Yossi was talking about a totally different thing. Don't say the Hallel Mitri. Don't say Psalm 113 through 118 every day. That's reserved for special occasions. But do say Psalms 145 through 150 every day. And in fact, if you say Ashrei, the whole of Psalm 145, plus those little fragments three times a day, a place is reserved for you in the world to come. Shep. Uh, this is something personal. Can you go down to uh, line eight? Of course. Eight. Here we yeah. come. Eight. Uh, oh, no, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is a personal thing. My my last name is pronounced correctly. Yeah. Wa Hanun. Wa meaning son of in Berber, and Hanun is compassionate. So that's the derivation of my name, Hanun. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. There's also a town in the Gaza Strip called Beit Hanun, which means house of the compassionate. I don't know if they're very compassionate to, to, to Israel. No, but, but, but it certainly is. And yeah, but it's interesting. That's just my name. That's a he, he, Berber Hebrew name. An auspicious name, <laughs> to be certain. Chanun v'rachum v'chanun in Yom Kippur. Exactly. And at other times. All right, Sarah and then Lisa. Okay, I'm going to ask for a personal indulgence. Um, can we go up to the top and can I just sing a couple of lines? Um, because this is what it yes. was like in our Orthodox day school. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I hope I remember it, but it, it just was so much fun. You'd get into a trance, basically. Yes. Oh, shoot. Okay. And it goes on, but anyway, I'm, yeah. I wish I remembered it just as well, but it, it was, yeah, it was not melodic. It was just like a, it kept going. The davening, for it. sure. It and you're, you're sort of like carried on the waves yes, of exactly. the melody. Do others remember that? Did anybody else have a day school experience like that? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I, I botched it so, but yeah, it's fun. I, I found myself when Ben was uh, reading it, singing it along and it was nice. Um, nice. And yeah, so, so Ben's saying same kind of memory. Um, Saul used that melody in conservative synagogue. Um, Cantor and Amy and I can probably relate to you that being in seminary and doing um, shahri tefillah every day, also, the, the recitation of this was a, a standby for me. Um, and there are some beautiful, and I don't want to steal Cantor Nimi's thunder, but um, there are some lovely, lovely musical renditions of this psalm and of certain lines of the psalm. But the, the one I'm going to share is actually from um, Psalm 115, the, the ending line of the Ashray prayer, because it's a Debbie Friedman song, and it's one of my absolute favorites of hers. It goes, um, so when reciting Ashrei, sometimes it's not uncommon in reform synagogues. I think it was Judy Hollander who remembered Shefa Gold's um, very contemplative, repetitious chanting uh, that, that she wrote for the line, Ashrei Yoshvei Vetecha. Perry Smilo also has a really fun one. And then you leave a little quiet space for people to work through the acrostic at their own speed. And then at the opportune moment, you close with Debbie Friedman's Va'anachnu. Okay, Harold and then Ben, and we'll see what time it is. I might have to let everybody I, I go. Sent, I sent this recording around yesterday from a class on Psalm 45 yesterday out right. in, uh, in, um, in Orange County. And there are two notes that I made that we haven't mentioned. One is how many times the word kol or hol is, is in this psalm. It's almost 20 times. This is mm. an all-embracing psalm. Kol yom almost every day. Yeah. Kol yom, etc. 
and the other thing was that the very first word of the book of Psalms is Ashrei, Ashrei Ha'ish, Asher Lo Halach B'derek Rishaim. And the rabbi who taught the class said, perhaps th 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 this is framed with that Ashrei line, um, mm -hmm. because if the book of Psalms starts with Ashrei, you are now in the final approach to Psalm 150 and the end. So we're going to bring back that Ashrei. We started with Ashrei and we end with Ashrei. Very nice. And thank you so much, Harold, for, for sharing that wonderful shiur. Um, and I thought it was it was so sweet and so beautiful that this group study has ignited a, a desire for, for study of the Psalms all across the country. That, that's a direct response of CBST's Psalm class. All right, Ben, what are you thinking? Uh, I'm curious if you have an explanation or an idea why the um, voice keeps changing mm. all over the place. Like for example, in verse six, it's uh, they will, yep. and the rest two words is I will. Yeah, it keeps changing all over the place, uh, various voices, and I wonder why. Yeah, and uh, Ben Ben Kushner, you pointed this out in the chat fairly early on that there's a lot of different voices. Um, so there might be a practical aspect to this that not only so we've got the the rigid form of the acrostic, right? You've got to start every line with the appropriate letter, except of course for nun. Notice too, though, that the, the pattern of speech, that these lines are basically all the same length. And as Sarah beautifully demonstrated, this is one that gets sung and the beat of the singing is fairly regular. So there's actually quite a careful architecture at work to make each line work. It's not just, you know, a rolling meditation that starts with the right letter. And so when the poet creates those strictures for themselves, um, they have to be creative. And maybe, I, I certainly don't know, I will be honest and say that, that this is only my supposition, that when you have accepted the rules for yourself of acrostic and certain strophe um, syntax structure to make each line feel the same on the lips, that you have to be willing to give up other artistic attributes and be more free in some places because you're being more constrained in others. And in order to make it all work within that structure, the author might have said, it, it matters less to me that the voice is consistent and it matters more to me that the shape feel consistent and fluid. Um, what I do like about it, completely interpretive is that it addresses God in all of these different voices. It gives you the sense of being in a very intimate, private relationship with God, and yet also surrounded by many people, and yet also uh, describing God from afar as if God wasn't even there. And so you move through these valences over the course of the Psalm, and that can be confusing, that can be distracting, but on the other hand, it really makes you feel like you're, you're part of a congregation. You're part of a large group. You're part of a small group. You're part of a single conversation. You're speaking only to yourself. And each of those different levels is represented in the voice of the psalm. And that too is quite an artistic feat. Thank you. We are sure. at time, Rabbi. Just All right. Time check. Well, this was a delight. Um, Psalm 145 is one of my personal favorites and given its uh, preponderance in Jewish tradition, it's one of the Jews' absolute favorites. Um, tomorrow we will study Psalm 146. And honestly, each, each of these Psalms, I know that this class has been through some Psalms that were, were really hard to dig into. These these are easy. These flow like water. Each one of them is more beautiful than the next. So I'll see you tomorrow for 146.